It's May 4, 2022, and welcome to Policy on the Frontier. My name is David Lees, and I'm your host today for this seminar. The Frontier Center for Public Policy is about better public policy for a better tomorrow. Our topic today, the real state of Canadian energy. We know that affordable, dependable, reliable, and now as we talk about uh, the tragic Russian invasion of Ukraine, now security are very important touchstones and foundational for our quality of life when we talk about energy. Today, we'll be talking a little bit more about a lot of issues related to this topic that may surprise you, facts and information that often you do not hear in the mainstream media. Our guest today is Terry Edom. He's a 25-year veteran of Canada's energy business. He's worked at a senior level across the industry in so many different roles. He writes for the BOE report, um, the Barrel of Energy report, which talks about daily commentary about the industry and is an influential voice in the oil patch. He's the author of numerous articles and including his best-selling book, The End of Fossil Fuel Insanity. Welcome, Terry Edom. Thank you for having me. Pleasure to be here. Well, Terry, I'm delighted to see you because we've got a lot to talk about, and I'm grateful that um, you can frankly bring us, uh, dare I say, a reality therapy session. Um, Thanks. I hope so. (laughs) The information regarding this this industry. I think a lot of people are, dare I say, have bits of of information or maybe even confused about what's really going on. Um, There's an awful lot of mythology. That's probably the understatement of the day. And I think that what you offer is a very interesting insight on looking at this uh, very foundational uh, policy issue. But I first of all want to start the stage a little bit with you personally, Terry, um, and that is who is Terry Edom and where did you grow up and how did you get involved in the oil patch? So I'm a Saskatchewan farm boy and when I grew up in Saskatchewan there wasn't um, much opportunity for farms. We went through a, a a uh, long period of drought and uh, my parents farm was in distress and I went to university to get to escape the farm and and pretty much the entire graduating class just simply moved to Calgary that's where all the jobs were so <laughs> so that and, and then I had um, I, I liked Saskatchewan I would have stayed um, but there were no jobs available and I had two or three job offers from Calgary in the oil patch and so I came out here and then I just never left it's a it's a wonderfully dynamic or it used to be a wonderfully dynamic industry and it's attracted entrepreneurial types from across Canada. So it's a real, um, there's a, an enormous pulse to it here. And there's still a pride to it, no matter what uh, what the world thinks. Um, and then how I got into the writing aspect of it, and people might be wondering why you listen to another guy from the oil patch, but the, the um, right, I've always wanted to write. And then I had the opportunity to uh, jump from a finance background, which is my background into a, a, a hybrid role as a communications director for a pipeline company. And when I started doing their public messaging, writing news releases and whatnot, I came to the realization that there was a lot of good messages that were happening within the industry that the industry just simply wouldn't talk about for um, historical inertia. I think uh, the industry has been u- used to dealing with governments and not the public. So there, there was, it was always the public, the public or governments wanted the energy industry to be developed. They, they invited hydrocarbon producers to come in and develop reserves. They cleared the way for pipelines. They, uh, they, the, the federal government actually mandated the construction of the pipelines, the original Trans Mountain pipeline to the coast and the one out east, like Alberta didn't want that. Uh, I learned that from Dave Yeager's great book. Um, so, th- so that's, there's been a total about face. And so I think the, the industry for decades was not used to dealing with the public and not used to explaining itself. And we still see this with the, um, the periodic attacks that come up about gouging for, for gas prices. It's like there's trading mechanics behind all of this, but the industry is never able to quantify this for the public time after time after time. Uh, they get the book thrown at them and it comes out, well, they didn't do anything wrong. And it's like, well, I wish the industry was better at stating yeah. its case. No, that's fascinating. So tell us about, you write regularly for the, the so-called BOE report. It's a very dynamic daily. What is that report? It's, it's an industry publication. It's like a, a trade industry publication, I suppose. It's full of news that pertains to the industry. And it's, it can be very technical. There'll be geological studies that show up and news about events that are happening. And the, 
the tone has shifted over time just because this, the, the center of focus of the energy industry has shifted over time. Now it's more with the, the climate change uh, narrative and it's, um, and my writing too has shifted from being more of an explanatory role where I felt like there was a, 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 a hole there of understanding for the public. They didn't understand what was happening. And that's why I dove in and thought, hey, maybe I can help explain this better. And then it became a defense mechanism where we're fighting for the, our right to exist as absurd as that sounds when, when hydrocarbons are so dominant. So you know, I, I certainly recommend the Beale report. It, it's a real eye-opener in terms of what are the current topics in the industry. So I, I would really recommend that to people. Now, if you look a little bit more strategically at the Canadian oil and gas industry, and I know you've played different roles, you've got a international perspective as well in terms of both data and you know, the talent pool is, is deep in, in, uh, in the industry. How do we really rank in the world? I know that we, we have our biases, but how would you characterize an industry that is often too often maligned, but is in fact uh, extraordinary when it comes to the world scene? That's a good question. We, we, we tend to view things from our own, inside our own bubbles, but there are many bubbles. There are different levels of bubbles. There's a Calgary bubble, there's an Alberta bubble, there's a Western Canadian bubble. Is not a bubble. So, so globally, unfortunately, I think Canada has been maligned. Our, our standards are incredible. If you, and I learned this when I was at a pipeline company, if you spill like a liter of oil off a lease, that's a reportable release to the government that Wait, it shows up can, in the statistics. Can you repeat that, Terry? A um, liter of oil spilled off lease is a reportable release, any volume greater than that. And I cho- that's reported, you're, you, you have to report that to the government. So wow. when you read- That isn't the case in Russia or Venezuela oh, or in Nigeria? <laughs> or most of the world. It's, um, yeah. I know people in the States that have, um, a friend of mine worked for a, um, um, a completions company and he was instructed, but he was a consultant. He was instructed by the drilling crew to go dump some drilling mud out into a field. And he said, I'm not doing that. And he just said, well, we'll get someone else to do it. It was on private land. So, but you, you can't do that here in Canada. So, so our standards are incredibly high, but it, that's something that's not widely noted. And I think that the, the act, climate activist movement seized on the oil sands and they've, they've smeared Canada with that just resource based in general. Like there's, I think there's a view outside and if I get this through indirect feedback or direct feedback from Europe or elsewhere that Canada is dirty oil that it's uh, the, the tar sands, they call it. There's no tar in it. It's just, that's a, a slur. Uh, so I, I think that we've kind of lost that battle from the oil sands perspective, but I think that as the as reality sets in around the world here with, the, with fuel shortages and natural gas shortages, mm-hmm. I think people are starting to stand up and speak louder for Canada. And I think the world is starting to say, hey, maybe we should be more selective where our fuel comes from. Exactly. Now, is Terry Edom, do you care about the environment? Absolutely. As do every, the, the people that, I, that care more about the environment than anyone I know are geologists because they, they're tied to the earth. They're earth scientists. They know they'll, they'll, they'll sp- spend two days telling you stories about shale beds and river streams and, and they like collecting rocks and, and they care about everything. And, and it's the, the to, to think that the industry does not care about the environment is absurd. I mean, there's bad players in any industry that will pollute or or what, whatever, but the, um, the, the, the lengths we go to, to prefer, and, and people don't complain, they just comply. That's what it is. I, I've known pipeline projects, $100 million pipeline projects that were shut down uh, for an extended period, but because there was spring runoff in one of the right of ways that included tadpoles in it. And wow. so if the, the entire operation shut down until it was known whether they were an endangered species or not. It's the little company believe. I work for, we, we work around trumpeter swan, uh, habitats and caribou habitats and burrowing owl habitats and, and and all of those things are just no go zones and, and that's just the way of life. Okay, it's so more, in your experience, how many years, Terry? Well, it's coming to closer to thirty. I was twenty five when I wrote that, but yeah, yeah. Okay, hard to believe. A long time. The environment is a, a very important issue, and you don't say that lightly. So that's on that note, um, it's interesting. You wrote in a very interesting book in two thousand nineteen called The End of Fossil Fuel Insanity. And it's interesting, uh, there's a little bit of a sub um, line which says clearing the air before cleaning the air. So there's an interesting kind of irony to that. So why did you write this book, Terry, in a, in a quick nutshell? 
I'd been writing for probably four or five years when I just, this um, <clears throat> feeling kept building that there, we're just getting nowhere with the energy dialogue. There, there's the, the uh, activist movement, which was, had taken over the media and they still have, they've taken over our governments and they, they, put, they have this very inaccurate, but very emotional messaging about we're all going to die in 30 or 40 years. And, and that's just, that's frightened everyone to the point where they're willing to choke off our fuel system. And that, that's my, it was a concern that our fuel system was going to get decimated was what led me to write this book. So I aimed this book right at the heart of the, the 80% of the population that really isn't interested in energy. People, people pay attention to energy when, when they're scared by activists or when their bills go up. And I think those are the two bookends. And in the middle, it's like, yeah, whatever. It's, it's just something that's there. You don't think about heat when you walk into a building, even though that's fundamental to our society. So uh, for one, as one example, so I wrote the book, it's fairly lighthearted, but it's packed full of information. And, and I tried to make it relatable to people. I just saying like, here, here's no one understands what hundred million barrels a day is, which that's the global oil consumption. So I tried to put numbers like that into a perspective that would make sense for people. Well, it's, it's, it's a very, it's a, it's a very insightful book and it's fascinating. You, you have a, a kind of a folksy, but witty uh, style of reading. And it's, so it's very readable and it's actually kind of gobsmacking at many points in terms of the, the energy insights. In fact, it's interesting. One of your reviewers said, um, this really needs to be ran, um, mandatory reading in every home, school and workplace in the Western world. So uh, go figure in terms of that kind of endorsement, Terry. So congratulations. Oh, thanks. And, and that's one thing that makes me feel good. I, 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 they, I've 99.9% .9 of the feedback is positive. And the only negative feedback I get tends to be uh, people in social media who are making, building their profile or something. But as far as direct contact, my emails out there and every post it's in my book and I, I get phenomenal feedback. I got a great email today from a guy in Florida that said, he said, thanks for your most recent um, article. I worked for Agriculture Canada as a scientist for 30 years. And, and he just, I just have it open here. And he's just like, I can't believe the, the inability of a lot of scientists to face reality if it means uh, hurting their funding. Isn't that and here's a guy who's in the trenches. And he said, he gives me specific examples of projects that he worked on where the message was not what the activists wanted to hear. So the message was not made public. So, well, that, that's kind of what I'm looking forward to today when I refer to this kind of reality therapy session. I Forgive me for using that, that term. But your book really deconstructs a lot of mythology out there and, and really puts in front of us um, some substantive facts that should really guide any policy discussion in terms of a viable pathway forward. And I mean that for the benefit of everybody. So if, if um, people dare to have a curious and a little bit of an open mind, I think they'll find the book to be really quite a good page turner. So, uh, so bravo on you. One of the things that the commentators have said is the book, or frankly, your approach to this issue of energy is more balanced. What do you think they mean by that in terms of balance? Well, I think in terms of my book, like I don't... Um... Uh, the, the activists, if they talk to me at all, they call me a fossil fuel shill and I'm not a shill and I don't defend the industry per se. And I know a lot of the people in the industry that, that are in favor of the cheapest, most reliable form of energy. And I know there's a lot of nuclear fans in the industry. So there's a lot of people in the industry that just say, we just need cheap, clean energy, the cleanest possible and nothing replaces hydrocarbons. So th there's a chapter in my book where I take uh, big oil to task for some of their, the things that they've done or the the messaging capabilities of the industry and the refusal to step up with wow. a with a coherent message to the public. So you take the energy, the oil and gas industry to to task. Well, I, yeah, I do, I do because I've seen it from the inside. An example is like the pipeline wars, where when when I worked for a pipeline company, there's a message going around the world that uh, diluted bitumen out of the oil sands is corrosive and it eats eats through pipes. And, and that was pushed by the likes of Greenpeace and, and, and that just became common knowledge in the media. And, and it was, it's profoundly untrue. There's no truth to it whatsoever. I, I talked to our engineering department and I said, is there any truth to this story? And, and um, a senior guy there said, well, we've been moving, we've been moving diluted bitumen down the same pipe for 30 years. There's zero corrosion. So 
there's no truth to it. And I said, okay, great. I'm going to go tell the world. And they're wow. like, no, you know, no, we're not talking. That about is that. utterly bizarre. So, um, bitch yeah. in, in the pipelines has no corrosive effect. And yet that has been kind of like a, um, it's a staple of their arguments against the oil sands. It's yeah. Yeah. Wow. And, so, so your criticism of the industry is that they weren't speaking up and correcting it. They, they weren't doing anything to correct it. And we used to, um, there at the pipeline company I worked at, there was a, a wall of shame, they called it. And it wasn't even shame, but it was like pipeline segments that they had dug up because a smart pig had told them that there was, it was no longer. What is a pig? You mean a smart uh, pig is, sorry, I jump into terminology. So a, a pig is something that you run down a pipeline that it's in a mechanical device that has all sorts of sensors and can take incredibly accurate readings about the thickness of the wall of the pipeline. And it can detect minute levels of corrosion, like a millimeter thick, wow. even externally. And so, and it's, it's, it's standard practice. A smart pig has run down major pipelines as a matter of routine. It's a government regulation. It happens all the time. And if it did, and if a pig detects a, a minute flaw in the pipeline, even on the external coating, and you're talking about something that might be like five millimeters thick. And if there's like a half a millimeter pit on the outside, that piece of pipe is dug up and replaced. And, and we, the pipeline companies keep those as examples and learning tools to show what happens like a, a micro cracking or uh, external corrosion. If the coating gets nicked by rock or something or the earth moves. And, and I, I was encouraging the industry, like take this sample set across the country, take it to town halls, show them what's unacceptable. Yeah, show what them a brilliant idea. Right. And, and, and just like, just like let your guard down for a minute and say, things do happen out there in the wild, but we have to show that we're in control of it. And, and they're just like, no, we don't like talking about that externally. So just no inertia to do anything. But one more quick example. And the floods of 2013 that happened in Calgary here that were pretty mm -hmm. devastating in the city. The pipeline company I work for has thousands of water crossings on their pipelines. And they mapped out before the floodwaters came into the main part of Alberta, where there were segments of pipe that might be exposed if there were extreme flood levels. There was two significant ones in Alberta. They, um, they sent operators out, they shut in those segments of pipe, they purged the oil out and, and they were ready for the floodwaters. And if the flood wiped that pipe out, there would not have been a spill because there's no oil left in it. They replaced it with nitrogen. And so I wanted to tell us a good news story because we're telling the world how we're managing the flood. And I was not allowed to speak about it. It was like, we're, we don't talk about our internal processes externally was all I heard. And I tried wow. writing up the story in the annual report at the end of the year. And the same thing, we don't talk about that. Wow, that's so, incredible. And those are recent examples, are they not? That was 2013, I think. 20, wow. Yeah, 2013 was the flood. So Okay, so, so, so let's um, let's look at a number of these erroneous assumptions, um, facts. Um, you know, I, I, I would say commonly that one of the things that we observe today is almost a kind of a delusional thinking. Some have coined it a kind of an anti-reality. Uh, perspective on life, when in fact, facts are more important than ever, are they not in terms of grounding on this discussion? So I want to go through some of those, um, frankly, a list of, of fairly direct questions that um, that will be our, our uh, therapy process today. So we really do take our energy system for granted in our lives. Um, uh, Terry, what do you mean by that? It's, uh, I mentioned it briefly a few minutes ago, but if you walk into a building, you don't think, you, no, no one that I know of or I've ever encountered is grateful that the building is warm. It, maybe if you're a rural person and you made a fire, but you, you go into a building in downtown Vancouver or Toronto or Calgary and, and there's heat there and, and, and no one stops to think, how did this get here? Where did this, where did the pipes come? How, how is there a gas field in in what northwestern Alberta that's bringing me gas here in Mississauga that's heating my building like how does this work and how does it work every day without fail and how does it never fail but those are just the kind of questions that just don't enter people's uh, minds and it's like any utility is the same thing people take power for granted if it never stops so we, we, we have we do an incredible job of providing reliable energy and it's the exceptions that really make the news if something happens in Texas where power goes out for two days, it makes the news everywhere. It's like, how could this happen? It's like in some parts of the world that happens every day, but we're so used to it here. When you get used to anything, when you get used to good highways, you notice a pothole. It's, I think that's just kind of human nature and, and energy is the most boring thing, especially when the industry doesn't defend itself. Right. So, and, and part of it is 
it, it strikes me that the system is extremely complex and it's really largely out of sight. Is that is that a fair comment? It's it's out of sight and it's it's yet ubiquitous at the same time. And and people just people won't believe that if you say if if you don't if you want to get rid of hydrocarbons, you can't have glasses like you're wearing and they'll go, yeah, right. And it's, but it's true. And you won't have you won't have the houses like you live in because it takes cheap or reliable hydrocarbons to allow companies to cut that wood and to process it and to haul it to you. And there's no replacement for these things. And it's everywhere. It's in your sneakers. It's in lipstick. Those are hydrocarbon products. There's any kind of plastic, which is everywhere you look. Is um, the internet dependent on oil and gas? Uh, yeah, without a shadow of a doubt, there's no, there's no way to keep data centers running. <laughs> and there's the, the myth of renewable energy is, is what's made it more of a challenge. And I think that the, the renewable energy advocates, renewable energy has its place and it would be the most awesome thing ever if you could get yes. all your power from the wind yeah. and sun, but it just doesn't work that way. You just right. can't wish away an old okay. system. So, so this is a prime example where is green energy green or is it all based on fossil fuels? And you'd say well, it is. It, well, that's that's a, another fundamental truth that people don't like to talk about either they look at they, they skip over the 90 percent of the work that takes to get there and they point to a, a windmill and say like this is this is clean energy or a solar panel it's like but where did that come from where did those materials come from how many mines were created which actually do rip up the environment like that like to me habitat destruction is true environmental devastation that's one thing that we should be guarding against there there's air pollution which is a bad thing there's in habitat destruction and and it's it, there's the technical people that look at the the hard facts of it the, of the story if you want to get to net zero 2050 there's there's the scientists the true scientists that are earth scientists like the geological survey of finland put out a study saying okay if we want to get to net zero 2050 here's what this means in terms of copper supply or, or demand and lithium and all of these other critical minerals. And their conclusion was, there's not enough reserves on earth to do this. They're, they're simply, we don't even know wow. of recoverable quantities of these materials to get us where we wanna go. So you need to resolve that before you dictate that you're gonna get net zero 2050, but governments don't listen. It's like, they're just like, um, net zero is, we have to get to net zero or we're all gonna die. But and they're not. They're not anchoring it to any kind of. It's not analysis. tethered to reality, and, and but there's a there's an academic body which will come up with studies that will say, well, hold on, we we've made it work here. Look at our model, and they'll build no. a spreadsheet model saying that well, we we think that there is enough copper because uh, governments are going to provide incentives for mining, but that goes against the grain that governments are actually making mining more difficult in, in almost every jurisdiction in the world. That's a, a democracy. Some places like China and Russia where their state totalitarian states they make happen what they want to make happen but like chile is is chile's a huge copper producer and they're limiting development of new mines for the environmental reasons the international energy agency which has gone all activist because i think they have a big european gun to their head and they got a lot more funding for 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 espousing a green narrative they they themselves put out a report last year before their net zero 2050 roadmap saying by the way we're going to need four to six times as many minerals are as are in production right now. And by the way, a new mine takes 18 years to come into production. That's Sorry, how many years? How many 18, years, Terry? 18, 18 years, one eight. Wow. And that's the historical average. Going forward, it's a lot more because the regulations are a lot harder. And and so where are these mines going to come from and who's going to build them? And I, I listened to conference calls from leading miners like Freeport MacMoran at their year-end conference call. They talked about their latest mine is in Indonesia, copper mine. And it took, they've been spending capital on it for 20 years. And they're saying there's nothing new in the hopper. In the short term, there's next few years, we have, we have nothing on the go because there's the governments won't allow mining to happen. And the, the Biden administration is no different. And Trudeau is saying he wants a, a, a mineral roadmap, but he they will throw the spokes in or they'll have protesters when we try and get something off the ground here too. That's the way the world works. Wow. So there's truly a, a, a sense of delusional thinking here. There's a kind of an academic exercise based on the theory of getting some kind of pathway to net zero, um, making a quote green transition. But if we examine these from all kinds of angles, including the ones you just outlined in terms of, for instance, uh, the inability to source rare minerals, 
uh, this is not grounded on reality. Is that that's the key point that you're making here? It's not grounded in reality at all, not as far as the productive capability of being able to create this new infrastructure and even the realities of, of um, energy consumption itself. The, um, uh, in 2019, a lot of people that wanted to see hydrocarbons die said that, well, this is the end of fossil fuels. Like we've peaked now, like Greta's in the street. She's convincing the children. Yes. How dare you? How uh, dare you? How dare you? Yes. And so, that, so it's all downhill for hydrocarbons for, for now because we're going green and we're putting up solar and wind. Well, in 2022, we're setting new records for consumption of not just oil, not just natural gas, but coal. They're all off the charts as well. Okay, as so, so energy. Terry, this was one of the key questions. So you're saying that the demand for fossil fuels has never been higher? Never been higher. That's right. It's increased and it's still increasing. And, wow. and it, it and, and the, the demand for renewables is increasing as well. It's the, the pie as, as seven and a half billion people in the world develop and those as six and a half billion people in developing countries want to live like we do, that just means the energy pie grows. So there's going to be all forms of energy in there. If we're successful, there's going to be nuclear, there's going to be wind and solar where they work, but it, the, the fundamental basis bedrock is going to be hydrocarbons indefinitely and there's just no way around that okay so to be clear that the, the main primary economic social geopolitical dynamic is a whole host of of nations where people's standard of living are rising and they they want to as you say live like us so to speak well and there, there's an example that uh, went around the web a few weeks ago there's 10 <laughs> countries in sub-saharan africa whose per capita energy consumption is less than an american's refrigerator so, so imagine th those, there's a billion people in Africa, 1.2 billion people that want to live like we do, and we have no right to stop them. And they want to develop their own hydrocarbon resources, and we have no right to stop them. You don't and, have that moral authority? I, I'd like to see someone explain it to me. There are people that are trying, like Bill McKibben, the founder of 350.org. Oh, yes, has, right. Yeah, he has an active campaign where he's trying to prevent new pipelines from being constructed in Africa. Okay. He wrote so, a, a, so the argument there is that basically uh, someone like him has the moral authority to assert that over um, those peoples uh, to keep them essentially into a, um, not the Stone Age necessary, but but something close to. Close to that. it. It's the it's it's eco colonialism. I've heard it described as, and it mm. makes that's a perfect term yeah. for me. And it, it's the, the this rationale that that we are we in the West are we're going to change our ways. We're going to we're going to guide everybody, but we can't let you develop your industry with hydrocarbons. Sorry, yeah, uh, you're just, just going to have to privilege uh, position, right? And 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 we, we we're sending the the West is spending obscene amounts of money to build. Solar, solar farms in Africa and, and whatnot. And, and I've heard from Africans myself, I have a lot of followers in Africa and they say like, thanks, but that doesn't help us. I want a fridge. I don't want power six yeah. hours a day. I want air conditioning. Right. I, I, want to, I want to be able to store a week's worth of food yeah. just like you do. Or, but, or, or have someone um, get away from cooking over a, a very dirty yeah. energy source. Burning dung. They end up getting lung disease and, and all the rest. So I want to just back up for a second. In terms of the strategic picture, then, what, like again, as part of our reality therapy exercise, if we think strategically about energy, that is good energy. We know that there's a couple key markers, like, and I want to go through those quickly. Affordability is one, a reliability and dependability. We saw that obviously last year in Texas when there was uh, winter storms and, and intermittent uh, energy supply. It's very yes. important. But then when we looked at this, um, we realized that we also have the issue of security. Namely, we have Russian invader, invaders in Ukraine, a terrible situation. Security is important. Good governance is important. So how important is it? Um, have we forgotten the whole criteria of security? When I think of Nord Stream 1 and 2, that, that ambitious, largely German uh, finance project to bring a Russian gas of all things uh, to Europe, particularly Germany, um, have we totally lost our minds and forgotten the criteria of security? We have, and it, it's, it's been too easy for too long. The, um, we, we've just come off a decade of incredibly low uh, oil and gas prices, particularly here in, in North America. And if you ask almost anyone in the world that pays attention to energy, they'll know what US shale is. And I think that's 
in one sense, part of the problem. There, there were stories that were being written 20 years ago about peak oil production. We're going to run out of cheap economical reserves. There's all sorts of oil in the ground, but it, it's a question of what is it worth? Um, a really seasoned geologist told me once about 15 years ago, he said, I can't show you any $30 oil. I could show you all the $300 oil you ever want. Uh-huh. And that's, that's true. It's just w- when does it become economic? So the U.S. shale revolution kind of upended that and it became it came out of left field. And they added a bunch of oil to, to global production and it created this glut in the market. And the Saudis and Russia both looked at this and they said, we can't afford um, we can't afford to have this happening uh, because you're going to take over our market share. Um, uh, so uh, sorry. So so we, we can't allow this to, to carry on. And um, they flooded the market with oil, essentially, or they signaled that they were going to flood the mm-hmm. market with oil. And that they didn't really do that, but that's that's how OPEC works. They make these signals, mm-hmm. and, and the U.S. shale producers just kept right on producing because they were getting good at it. So, so the shale revolution in the U.S., which actually wasn't as big as people think, they, it added five to six million barrels a day of oil out of a global uh, production base of a hundred million barrels a day. So, it was big, but not that big. But there and there are huge fields. The U.S. Um, the Marcellus Appalachia shale field is the biggest in the world. The Permian is one of the biggest fields in the world, but those are it. So, so as those get developed and exhausted, and they've been developed very, we're being developed very rapidly. So they're they're no they're they're at the point where they're saying, the on the gas the natural gas side, the Appalachia Basin is saying, well, we have a lot more gas here, but not at three or four dollars a GJ or an MMBTU. It's going to take seven or eight dollars. Oh, and by the way, we need pipelines out of the region to be able to develop it. And these activists have it ring fenced in saying, no, you're not building any more pipelines. Mm -hmm. They won't let them do anything. Permian is a little, can grow its production easier because it's on the Gulf Coast. So they can ship it, the oil particularly, but it's a finite thing too. So, so our security supply, we've been, uh, it's been masked over the past decade by this abundance that we see in North America. And we're ethnocentric. We just see our own view and Europe to a certain extent has said, oh, we got all that Russian gas. We got Russian oil. We're good. Uh, the rest of the world has has been acutely aware that of energy security. Uh, places like Japan, which is a huge consumer and has very little reserves, or Africa, which wants to develop their reserves, or China, which has so many people, they they know all about energy security. We don't listen to them though. We listen to our academics and our media and whatever else, and and so we've been kind of hoodwinked. And now we're now there's a great awakening coming here coming that energy is not so secure at all. And by the way, where does it come from? And people are realizing, oh, it comes from places like Russia or exactly. Iran. Sorry, but, but I think it's very interesting, Terry, that your point, and this is this is something that, that I really appreciate within your book, is that um, Canada has a little bit of an echo chamber going on, or even North America, when it comes to the issue of energy. We don't look at the energy stage globally and um, like your point, uh, for example, uh, just a few minutes ago, is that uh, the demand for uh, fossil fuels has never been higher. And yet within Canada, somehow we think it's declining. It isn't. It is uh, expanding and, if anything, speeding up momentum for the reasons that we mentioned. And so for me, I guess one of the questions I have is when we get to the other criteria, which is affordability, how important is it to have affordable energy, let alone dependable, reliable, and secure? I, I, you, I, you can't underestimate how important it is. The, the average Canadian is not wealthy, and the average Canadian lives paycheck to paycheck. And I don't remember the most recent statistic, but a lot of people have very little set aside for retirement. And, and when you live paycheck to paycheck and your fuel bill goes up by $200 a month, that's a very big deal to a lot of people. And your heating bill goes up. And and the, and the government bribes them with a bit with a carbon tax check now and then, but that doesn't compensate for the fact that everything costs more. And then there's the knock-on effects, which people don't understand the um, the ubiquitousness of hydrocarbons. Like I said, they're in everything. Well, when the price of natural gas shoots up, there are industries that cut back on fertilizer, they cut back on aluminum production, they cut back on mineral processing because it's no longer economic. So, so where does that show up? Well, that shows up in scarcity of vehicles. It goes up, shows up in scarcity of parts. It shows up in various things that people need. What about uh, food, Terry? Sorry. Is that coming? 
What about food, the impact of energy? What's happening right now? It's just, I was in Saskatchewan. I, I, the blog post that I wrote, I was in rural Saskatchewan and I went to, uh, in, in a small town visiting my mom and I, I went to Coffee Row and to have breakfast and on the menu, it said the breakfast special was $8 or something. And on the board, it says it's $12 but they don't print their menus every month. Right. But that's the impact. It's, and I was the only one eating in the place. Everybody else was just drinking coffee. And that's wow. one of the reasons I went to the grocery store to, with my brother and a, a jug of four liter jug of milk is $8. And you see these, these mothers buying these groceries and they're putting $10 worth of gas in their car. They're stretching their dollars thin. Yeah. And, and th- this is happening. We don't see it as much in the urban centers because we tend to be wealthier and we're, we're more of the middle class and, and, and the media class no. and the laptop class. So, but, but the point is that this is a moral issue, isn't it, uh, it's Terry? It's absolutely a moral issue. As, as you start hammering away at the middle class, it's almost like Canadians will, will realize kind of almost the semi-dystopian reality of Europe where you have these documented cases. They're actually very tragic of people, particularly on fixed incomes, choosing between food or heating their home. And some people even oh, really? actually passing away because of this. Is that right, Terry? I, I, I don't have any statistics on that, but I know that that's a, a reality. And that's why Europe is capping people's utility bills. I read that Europe spent $400 billion last year subs- in fossil fuel subsidies, which they introduced themselves voluntarily, which no one likes to talk about, but they're subsidizing people's heating bills to keep them from rioting. And there have been riots around the world, Sri Lanka, Africa, people are running short of fuel and, and, and the cost of living is, is just going up. So it's absolutely a, a moral thing. We, we, I hear a lot in the chattering class, especially the activist class that's so concerned about climate change. They say, well, you know what, people, we're going to have to do without our vacations. We're going to have to do without, we can't drive SUVs anymore. We're going to have to get electric cars. It's like you're, you're talking about luxury items for which a lot of the population, that is not applicable. If you if you go to some rural part of New Brunswick or Quebec and you say, well, because of fuel costs, you're going to have to cut out your vacation. They're going to say, well, no, actually, I have to cut out food, like you say, or buying beef or whatever. Uh, th- that's a that's a big deal for people. So yeah. it's not that this this urban ethnocentric view that hardship means no more weeks in Mexico. That's not reality for most of the world. Yeah. So I want to ask you another question that has to do with dare I say so many Canadian commentators, let alone elected decision makers, do they not understand this reality? I think it was all stunning last year when we saw the, um, the Glasgow summit uh, with uh, all the, the usual actors show up um, with private jets, hundreds of jets. um, And they don't even remember that. In fact, this is a, a, a fact that you point out in the book since the signing of the Paris climate accord in 2017 if memory serves me correctly there uh, how many new coal-fired plants have been built in china terry do you remember that figure i don't remember that statistic it's it's a huge number it's, i think uh, it was 1900 something like that yeah and there's like hundreds being built right now as we speak so and that's and they're 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 under construction and and the chinese government has instructed their industries to produce all the coal they can and, and, and they are, the uh, activists like to point out that China is a leader in renewable energy because they put up more solar than everybody else. And that's true, but they also put up more coal plants than everyone else too. Exactly. That's what happens when you develop your population. So No, it it's truly is remarkable. So you're, you've just said earlier that obviously um, fossil fuel will ultimately come to an end as the marginal cost continues to rise. I think you, you alluded to that uh, Caspian Sea project, which is something like $50, $60 billion, as I recall. But then again, you can't even get to it because you have governance issues in that whole region. Um, but as we look to that, that's what you mean by the really big transition. Is that right? Away from fossil fuels. Well, that's right. And ever since I've started in the business and everybody that I know in the business is aware that um, we won't live a hydrocarbon life indefinitely. At some point that changes. But the way it should change is is gradual and over time, and it should be driven by a price mechanism. And then the the easiest way it should happen is if they and and there's there can be a role for governments to like mandate better fuel efficiency standards and 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 um, if they're going to give subsidies, I'm not a fan of subsidies of anything, but help people retrofit their homes for better heating efficiency and whatnot. 
but but as the price of fuel climbs gradually, people can adapt to this over time. But the the idea has been planted in government's head, and they just listen because for whatever reason that this can happen quickly and it's going to happen quickly. We're going to get off hydrocarbons quickly. We have to divest fossil fuels to cut it off at the source, and, and they're but they're cutting off the supply before there's no alternative. And and you it, it, the system is too big and too all encompassing for that to happen. Okay, so so if I'm if I'm understanding you correctly, then Terry, you'd say that the transition needs to happen, but in the meantime, we frankly don't understand how dependent, thoroughly dependent we are on fossil fuel, and how significant that that transition will be. And in the meantime, we're wasting a lot of time on dead end policies like what is it, net zero by 2050? Well, and, we, we don't even know what a transition means. Like if you're if, if, if you're serious about reducing CO2 in the atmosphere, if you think that is the, the way to save humanity and you think about it from a global perspective, the first thing you would do would be to say, we need more natural gas and we're going to replace all the coal in, in the world. That would be the, that's the lowest hanging fruit. That's the smartest way to do it. The infrastructure is there. The manpower is there. The ability is there. The resources are there. That, the, the U.S. is one of the few leading um, jurisdictions, or they have one of the biggest emissions reductions uh, in the past decade. And it's mostly because they got, they moved from coal fired power to natural gas fired power. Interesting. We did the same for China and India and places in Africa. Wow. We, we would, we would go a long ways towards meeting people's emissions reduction so, targets. So, so LSG would be a logical positive phase up in terms of policy. We should be doing um, pardon the analogy, full throttle, <laughs> full throttle, on, yeah. on LSG, right? L- LNG, yeah, liquefied natural gas. It's a gl- becoming a globally traded commodity. But but Canada itself, instead of spending billions of dollars here, converting, convincing <clears throat> people to in, to try that they're going to have to drive electric vehicles in a climate which they do not work for. They might work in cities, great, but Canada as a whole is not suited for it. Take those billions of dollars and and build an LNG terminal in, in, in India or exactly. Pakistan or somebody that wants it mm-hmm. and clean up their air where they have the real uh, emissions problem. And, and then that buys the whole world time. First of all, the whole world can develop like they want to. They can do it cleaner. And then we have the, we have more lug, the luxury of more time to develop technology that actually works, that isn't going to rip the world apart trying to find every last atom of um, right. copper. So LNG, very important kind of initiative. And what what a potential benefit for everybody, including Aboriginal peoples. It's it's really kind of an exciting opportunity for us, isn't it? Let's talk a little bit about ESG, the so-called Environmental Social Green Movement. Um, Many like myself would say it's about making our investments woke, in, in many ways not even enabling us to in a transparent fashion, even be aware that it's being directed in that way. So um, we know the usual cast of characters. Uh, I know Mark Carney spoken um, strongly in favor of this. Um, you know, we've got people from Black BlackRock and and Larry Fink and all the rest. Um, so the idea is to have this kind of value laden set of index uh, indexes that move the money in in their um, desired fashion. Um, what do you think about that? And I guess I'm asking that question because I heard that um, we, we've all heard about the Canadian pension plan apparently last year uh, selecting based out of some kind of ESG index that they have choosing Russian oil and gas over Canadian oil and gas. How do you do that? How do you possibly come up with that? That seems um, quite uh, a lack of common sense, if not diabolical. Yeah, I'll take a step back first on that part. The um, um, ESG in theory, I mean, I love it. And the the governance part is is, as important as any of them. I was furious after 2008 with Wall Street. When the Occupy Wall Street movement started, I was like, you go. Like, I'm cheering you guys on because something's got to change there. They, the, Wall Street, the the financial engineers brought the world to its knees. Exactly, and yeah. the Mark Carneys of the world and the Black Rocks of the world should have been held accountable for their role in that. Right, uh, he was a governor at the time, but but there's a whole subset, of, and that's a governance issue. So ESG is 
is very important, I think, if it's if it's treated the way it should be treated. But it's become an environmental tool and it's become a tool of the climate movement. And so you're, you're seeing these absurdities, just like you pointed out, where where Canada is being punished because our government sets standards which are like 40 percent greenhouse gas reductions by 2030 or whatever their this week's number is then it's it's super challenging to meet so our government or our um, the canada pension plan plan players of the world will buy oil from somewhere else or buy shares of companies from somewhere else because they don't have the same um they're not being held to the fire like we are it's it's and they say canada's dirty oil and it's i wrote an article a long time ago about that like well what's what is clean oil? What's the footprint of a war in the Middle East or the fighter jets that that protect that oil or the bombs and whatever? What what is the true footprint of oil? Like you, yeah. they, we 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 hand them all of the information to measure in excruciating detail to measure the emissions output of our oil sands because that's how we do. We, it's it's wide open. Everyone can see everything that happens. Every molecule of gas that's burned to produce that oil, it's all laid out. What what's the equivalent in China or Russia? Exactly. It's whatever they tell you. Yeah. And and so they, they can make claims to be e- on the ESG path. We don't know. We, we, there's no way of verifying any of this information. So it, it's it's one of these absurdities that have come out of Mark Carney's initiatives here where he's lined up all of these entities and they're just following the money. The Black Rocks of the world are despicable. If you ask me, they're, they're, they're this wealthy beast that just follows the money and they can see trillions of dollars going into green energy so here we go and and they make a lot of money there's a lot of people making a lot of money in green energy they're building all of these these white elephants that are that are not solving anything they're creating problems like california's more advanced than anyone in terms of renewable energy and they're headed for the cliff they're because they're they're destroying the the sanctity of their energy system and their their grid operators tell me this the people that work there saying you're absolutely right when you say that, that our, our grid is being put at risk here, but we can't stop these green forces, especially trillions of dollars. So No, it, it's very disturbing. So can we talk a little bit about the Canadian oil and gas sector? It's uh, obviously oil is, um, is uh, the price has gone up high. What's the mood like on the ground? What's, what's it like in the industry? And are people investing in new sources of energy um, in Canada these days? It, well, it's a frightening dichotomy. Most people that I know that are starting a new venture are starting something in the green energy space. There's hydrogen companies starting up. There's carbon sequestration companies. There's new energy. It, it's unbelievable the groundswell of people that are leaving the oil patch and going into these new companies, even though there's not a regulatory framework for them to make sense. Wow. There's all of these things happening there's there's a company I know that's developed a new carbon sequestration technology. It's an oil and gas company, and they've set up a subsidiary, and they've got a they've got a technology that works. But the federal government regulations are conflicting with the provincial government regulations, and they they they, they, they need resolution before they can even start doing what they are able to do. And Brookfield gave them a check for three hundred million dollars, which is absolutely backwards. That they're, yeah, they're getting funding of hundreds of millions of dollars for a technology which they can't even put into play yet, uh, which is the which is not the way projects work. Normally, you prove the economics of a project yeah, right. beyond a shadow of a doubt. Then you apply for financing. And if you're lucky, you get it. Here, it's the cart before the horse. So th- that's where all of the money is going. That's where the activity is going. And what's really frightening to me is there's a, a ton of geological talent and geophysical talent and petroleum engineering talent. Who, who these people that have been suffering for years in this industry and being tired of being slammed by relatives in Ontario and Vancouver. And they're they're as soon as their share prices of their companies go up, they're grabbing that money and they're heading for the hills. They're saying, I'm out of here. Wow. And we're losing an uh, unbelievable layer of talent, uh, world-class talent. Calgary's or Canada's geological, geophysical, petroleum engineering talent is as good as anywhere in the world. We're a mm-hmm. real strong center and and we're losing all that we're, we're chasing them away and the government is chasing them away actively chasing them away saying we want you to transition out of the industry we don't want you to be in the industry so i i think we're just setting but in the meantime up. if if i can mention that we're we're going down dare i say bunny trails that are that are policy dead ends they're not really they're, viable solutions to the big energy transition 
And meanwhile, we're losing valuable infrastructure, including people, leadership in the oil oil patch. That's absolutely correct. And the absurdity just will not make it out into the media. There's a, I mentioned the California grid, for example, the California grid operator has, has said in government hearings and in their publications online, like, we have too much solar, stop with the solar. Like we have a glut of power in the middle of the day. We have no way to store it. And that's not when our power peak demand is. And power prices in California routinely go negative in the middle of the day because there's too much power. They don't need more solar, but California is building more solar. And, and we're doing this. We're going to do the same thing in Canada here. We're going to build more and more solar and everybody's going to go, yeah, look at the, all the solar installed. We're creating problems for which there are no solutions. And when you have too much power of one source at the wrong time of day, and you, but you incentivize those uh, producers, solar producers, you chase away the baseload guys who are, yeah. who are running away saying, we can't make a buck in this industry when we have to pay a, a power bill in the middle of the day for the power we produce, which is an absurdity. And, and it, but the governments aren't listening to this. Or yeah. They're just so, hearing on more solar. So what so, a stunning, stunning mistake. Um, you know, I was just talking to um, a, a friend of mine, a veteran oil leader for years and he says that the really the industry has been sidelined in oil and gas as long as they recognize that they have a federal government and others that are extraordinarily hostile to the Canadian industry. I think that pretty well sums it up, doesn't it? It's true on a business level and it's true on a personal level. On a business level, what's happening now, the industry is generating incredible cash flows and that money's heading for the exits. Yeah. The companies are buying back shares, they're paying dividends. They're not growing production. I mean, there's some little bits of growth here and there. Mm. This is really noticeable in the U.S. And they're, and, and they're like the big U.S. producers, the ones that are willing to speak publicly that aren't too politically correct, like the big oil players, the, the mid-tier guys are saying, like, we've had it with government policy and we, you won't allow us to do what we need to to solve your energy problem. Yeah. Joe well, Biden, you're crazy. going to, yeah, we're, 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 the U.S. especially is going to, they're going to Venezuela and asking for more oil production yeah. there, but they won't ask their own producers in their own yard. Wow. Now, speaking of quote narrative or, or branding of the industry, we know that hundreds of millions of dollars have been used to systematically go after the Canadian oil and gas industry. Largely, uh, largely that money has come from um, foreign foundations, dare I say American ones like Tides, Rockefeller, Rockefeller to name a few. Um, our friends um, at Frontier, Vivian Kraus and, and Elizabeth Nixon, have documented this for years. It's really stunning. So would you say there's been a disinformation campaign um, with the industry for years? And, and why hasn't the industry kind of come to the table to combat this? Um, I know it's sometimes hard to protect yourself, but it's almost like, are they, are they fearful? Are they trying to play along with it with the hope that they'll go away? They don't recognize this is really, dare I say, an existential threat. What, what's, what's going on here? I think that at, at, at a certain level, the, the activists took over uh, quick and fast and hard and they, they took over the media, they took over governments and, and, and industry was so flat footed for such a long time. When I, when I worked for the pipeline company, I was part of the messaging committee for an industry association and they would put out messages, which would be just like a sequence of facts. And there it's an engineering mentality. Well, if we just explain the facts to people, they'll get it and this will all blow over. And I think that was the, the, the people, the, there was this, there, there, you would get nothing but eye rolling downtown when people would talk about the anti-pipeline activists, they'd go, well, everyone's going to figure out that the pipe, a pipeline is the safest way to move product. It's just so obvious. Yeah. And that, that was the mentality. And, and it, it's true. But that doesn't mean that you're, you're, you're competitive in that arena for public opinion. And, and you would see this, and I talked about it in my book, the, the tentative. So the green pieces of the world figured out social media. They hired savvy kids to spread disinformation and, and hate campaigns, literally. And then uh, the energy industry would pop up on Twitter with a little tweet about some little thing, and they would just get slaughtered by the, in the court of public opinion. And they just sort of retreated from that. They just didn't really seize onto that. It's like the, they, they'd already lost the battle, and then they're wow. losing the war because the governments joined forces with the green activists. So I, I think that, that, that there has been a disinformation campaign for sure. So 
Okay, so one of the questions that we have is how do we um, look not only at the supply side, but the demand side of managing energy demand better? Like how do we reduce the amount of, like as Canadians, we are significant energy producers. Is that all about, again, um, we're not only good energy producers, pardon me, but we also use up a lot of energy. So how do we moderate that demand? Is it through the price mechanism again? I think it's through the price mechanism. That's where governments can do wise things like uh, set fuel efficiency standards. I don't think it's wise to say everyone has to go all electric, but I think if if a government said, do we, I mean, do the government doesn't have to say this, but do we really need four and 500 horsepower cars everywhere? Maybe the government puts a strict tax on anything over 300 horsepower or something that doesn't get 50 miles per gallon or whatever. There, there are ways to, to influence that behavior. It's exactly. so... Uh, on the demand side and, and, and maybe there are uh, flying should be more expensive if that's what, but that happens automatically with higher oil prices. There's, there's one thing that I just want to, a misconception that can sometimes creep in here where Canada singles itself out as being particularly egregious because Canada is quite often flagged as a high per capita emitter of energy. And so we feel guilt about that. And that is the last thing we should feel. And we're, we're a high per capita emitter because we provide everything for the world. So we, we, when we produce enough food to feed half of India, that shows up on our tab as emissions. When we produce aluminum for the world, mm. that's on our tab of emissions. Good point. Yeah. But we produce 5 million barrels a day of oil and we consume three, that the X or whatever the numbers, the, the, that extra 2 million is on our account. So we, we provide all of this for the world and then we pay the price on a per capita basis because there's a big footprint involved in producing anything but it's what the world needs. So Canada should not penalize itself for being a high per capita emitter. You can't take that number into, you, you, if you take that, want to get concerned about that number, you have to consider what we're benefiting the world too. Okay, that's a very good point. Um, I want to go through a couple things as we kind of get into the home stretch, Terry, but one of them, which is the so-called energy discount. We only have one, in effect, one primary customer, and that is the United States. So we, we get a lot less money uh, for our oil and gas. Can you tell us more about that dynamic? That's just, yeah, it's a fundamental truth. We're totally landlocked with the exception of like Trans Mountain Pipeline and, the, um, and our, any conduit we have through the U.S. to get to a port. And that's, we, we, yeah, our, our natural gas price in Canada, well, it's jumped up. It's like 7 or $8 a gigajoule. It's, that's about one-fifth of the global price right now. If we could export natural gas onto the global market, we're leaving billions of dollars at stake probably every week by not having several LNG terminals on the, on the coast because we could be helping the world with their shortage and also benefiting from those prices ourselves. So, so why would our politicians, and I know it's a dynamic model, why would our elected officials put up with that? Like we're, we're talking five, $20 billion a year, depending on the pricing. It's absurd. What country would ever in their right minds put up with that? It's far more than that per year. It's, it's um, the, the numbers are off the charts, but that's, that's way too low. So you're ta- but, seeing but, way over 20 billion I've, I've, per I'm, year. I'm taken. Yes. It, it's, it's, it's an excess of a billion dollars a week. I'll be a conservative week? there that wow. because the, the, the value of, uh, if you think of 2 billion cubic feet a day, which is what um, um, that terminal is going to, do in bc when it gets going in 2025 right that pipeline that'll take it there is five billion cubic feet a day and we're leaving 25 to 30 dollars uh per thousand cubic per mmbtu or thousand cubic feet on the table by not by not accessing that market so so the the question is why do governments allow that well how does how does trudeau who's put Guy bo in charge of the the climate file how does he backtrack and say actually i want lng now how does he backtrack and say, actually, we need more tankers off our coast? Uh, he, he, it's politically unacceptable for him to do that. It's that's that's just a function of politics. I don't know how that would. Wow, but no, yeah. it is it is truly stunning because this is if the numbers are as high as you say are say they are. Regardless, this is a this is an awful lot of resources that would really change our standard of living and and our future yeah. in every respect, wouldn't it? In every um, respect, yeah. And we'd be exporting cleaner fuel to the world that okay. is desperate for it. So I I um, read a lot of polls every day, including the um, the uh, uh, incredible uh, Rasmussen polls. 
And mm-hmm. I was delighted to see last week, uh, as you did too, that um, uh, by far a majority of Canadians would, Americans, pardon me, would love to see the Keystone XL project go ahead. And this is an example where I think in the first hour of the Biden administration, they um, took a, uh, took that one off the table. It's, it's, it's truly uh, bizarre in retrospect. So we have in Canada, what's known as the Impact Assessment Act, the so-called No Pipeline Act. Uh, and I know Alberta is challenging this. I read the bill. It's, it's utterly bizarre. As you look back. at uh, challenging everything from from climate change to even gender, you have to read it to believe it. But do you have any hope that Alberta will successfully challenge this bill and 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 get rid of it? On the on the emissions grounds, I don't think they would have much success. The, the Supreme Court seems to have not been helpful there. They they've ruled that because emissions are federal jurisdiction. So, uh, but but on the gender and um, whatever the other point of absurdity is there i don't know i you would hope that they would be successful but i just don't i don't know you can't there there's nothing that's too absurd to believe right now the things that are happening in the world this is crazy the, the, the bill is essentially the federal government wants a veto on anything right that doesn't that doesn't line up exactly with their ideology exactly and, yeah so, so i think you hit the the um the nail on the head so to speak now there are solutions. Obviously, it would be to get um, energy to Tidewater. Um, I know there's a number of teams working on it, like you've got uh, the Nistanen group, uh, a number of First Nation proponents looking at trying to bring energy from the West and other commodities uh, through to Hudson's Bay, including Port Nelson. Uh, do you think that would be a, um, a solution? Do you think that would be a, a positive uh, development? Oh, it would be a phenomenal development. I would, I would love to see that. Just another option for Western Canada. And, and I'm glad to see First Nations involvement and some of them are spearheading these. It's fantastic. I just, I'm, I'm just depressed at the thought that any of these will ever happen. If like the, the federal government essentially killed the Energy East pipeline, a pipeline for which two thirds of it was already in the ground. They killed it when they told Trans Canada at the Times, TC Energy now, that they would have to justify um the emissions for not just of the operation of the pipeline itself but the emissions caused by the product that would be consumed that went through the pipeline which which is called scope three emissions and and that's just an impossible bar to meet so so that was the same federal government so would they would they apply the same logic to any other pipeline that they could I, i don't see why they wouldn't they they do not like hydrocarbons and they want the industry to go away so the Trans Mountain, I think that they 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 bought it and they're completing it. There would have been a revolution if they hadn't done that. It was already underway and it's an existing right of way. And um, but they're seeing the challenge of actually getting that built to build a greenfield pipeline through through territory like that. I I just the, the given the um, the act active players against it and the the depth of their pockets and their power and sway with the government i don't see how anything like this could get off the ground if it was purely first nations led and financed and driven and they were willing to to go to battle over it then i think that maybe that would really help and i think first nations are absolutely critical to any resource development that's going to happen in this country from here on that's exactly right and so here um lies some hope um and when you look to the future terry are there things that you think we as Canadians, as consumers can be doing on this very seminal issue, whether it's um, contacting elected officials, whether it's the media, or even our bank? Yep, that's right. Any anything you, Anytime you hear nonsense, stand up and say that's nonsense. Or if you hear something that you think is a priority, there's, um, there's players out there that are still pushing the climate change narrative in the face of this global fuel crisis. And and if people stand up and say, you know, there are actually other things we, we could lose civilization in three years here if we run out of fuel. Don't worry about 30 or 40 years with a theoretical calculation based on someone's model. So I think there, there are ways to just stand up and, 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 and say, you know, I don't accept this as, as a, a given um, if you believe that way. And, and you mentioned the First Nation support, support First Nations like this is it's wonderful to see. The excitement among First Nations. I talked to a few different uh, 
um, First Nations that are near our operations, little company I work with, they're just brimming with energy. They're like, this is our time. This is, we can develop resources. We can participate. We can make sure the environment is stewarded because we live here. We understand the way it works and what's important and what isn't. And they're, they're brimming with enthusiasm to get projects off the ground. They're lined up around the block to buy an interest in pipelines like Trans Mountain Expansion. Uh, they're, they're proposing new pipelines themselves. They're proposing carbon sequestration plans. They're, they're just so excited to be players in the industry. And it's, it, that's one of the best things I've seen in forever is to see this, this active um, enthusiasm amongst First Nations and so many of them. Uh, so that, that's a, a point of hope. So support them however it works and um, stand up to tyranny. <laughs> well said, Terry. Well, that brings our time together as a close. I, I want to thank you, um, Terry Edom, industry leader, commentator, and author. We're so glad that you could join us today and we're very grateful for your leadership and your insights on such a critical issue. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And thank you to all of you, uh, friends of Frontier who joined us today. Keep involved with the Frontier and we welcome your comments. Be sure to join us next week for Leaders on the Frontier on Wednesday, May the 11th for a special session. We're pleased to announce that our guest will be the Honorable Preston Manning. Mr. Manning will be talking about the need and vision for a possible inquiry into the management of COVID-19. The question is, what are the policies and actions which need to be examined? How might a citizen's inquiry bring thoughtful insight and even accountability in this chapter of Canadian history? Please join us for this special session with Mr. Manning and others to what will be a landmark discussion. Thank you all to you who've joined us today and thank you to all of you who donate to the Frontier. You make our mission possible. Frontier is nonpartisan and we do not accept any government funding. And that's it for today. And remember, without open discussion and debate, you are not thinking and nor are you free. Keep asking good questions and do not be afraid. On behalf of all of us at the Frontier, thank you so much. <laughs>